Thank you. Thank you very much. Chemistry, not exactly what you bargained for, is it? Because to so many people out there, it's kind of a dirty word. Indeed, at the prospect of chemicals invading your life, I think sometimes you just want to scream. And the fact is that we have an image problem in chemistry, to be sure. How so? It's actually a multi-image problem. There are those people who think that we're just nerds. Then there are those who think that chemists are those mad scientists locked away in a lab somewhere just thinking about what new cancer-causing additive to unleash on the unsuspecting public. To many, chemistry is the work of the devil. What we do is mix up chemicals, and those chemicals are synonymous with toxins. So people strive to get products that are free of chemicals. <laughs> the most absurd of all expressions. Indeed, if you buy something that is claimed to be chemical free, you're not getting a very good deal. <laughs> because what you're buying is a vacuum. <laughs> not a vacuum cleaner, a vacuum. That's the only thing, if you can call it a thing, that is chemical free. But people strive for a chemical-free existence. They want to bring up their kids in a chemical-free world. They want them to play with chemistry sets that require no chemicals. <laughs> Truly amazing. You know, it turns out that a 4% solution of acetic acid is thought of as a chemical. But you take that same solution and you put it into a bottle of vinegar, all of a sudden it becomes a green cleaning agent. <laughs> Indeed, chemical names turn people off. beta fructofuranosyl alpha diglucopyranoside I'm sure strikes terror into the heart of many people. It causes panic. And yet, what you just saw is the chemical term for sugar. You cannot tell anything about the safety or the danger of a substance by the number of syllables in the name. The only way that you can tell is by studying it, testing it. That's how we accumulate scientific knowledge. And that's what we try to do through my office at McGill, the Office for Science and Society. We try to cast a beam of light into the darkness to try to demystify science, because indeed it is complex and so many people are bewildered by it. My specific interest is the area of chemistry, which I think should be in the limelight. Now, I'm fully cognizant of the fact, of course, that there are skeletons in the chemical closet. Certainly, historically, we have not always dealt properly with chemicals. Indeed, chemicals in the wrong place at the wrong time at the wrong dose can be a huge problem. We have not always disposed of chemicals in a proper way. But the fact is that this science far as chemistry is the thread that ties all of the other sciences together. If you know something about molecules and how they interact, what they can and cannot do, you get a pretty good idea for what can and cannot happen in the world. Indeed, chemistry is the fabric of our life, both figuratively and realistically. It is the stuff that puts color into our life. It is useful. You look under your sink, you will find all kinds of cleaning agents. Well, what are they? It's just a collage of chemicals. Open your medicine cabinet. That mix of chemicals we call drugs. You look down at your dinner table, and the food is nothing other than a very, very complex mix of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different compounds. In fact, there are some 60 million known chemicals that are listed in chemical abstracts. Most of them, of course, occur in nature. Some are synthetic. But whether something is synthetic or natural, 
does not determine its impact on our health or what happens in the human body. The body does not distinguish by ancestry. So we have about 60 million known compounds. If you sniff your cup of coffee, what you're smelling, believe it or not, is roughly 1,000 different compounds. It's amazing that we have been able to determine this. Many of them, in fact, have been categorized. Some of them are known carcinogens, and yet we know that coffee does not cause cancer. If it did, we would know. There's enough epidemiological evidence. There are enough people in the world drinking this stuff to know what it can and cannot do. So how is it that there are carcinogens in there, but the whole mixture is not carcinogenic? Well, obviously, because the carcinogens are found in very small amounts. And furthermore, some of the other antioxidants that are present in the coffee mitigate the effects of the more problematic compounds. So indeed, we live in a very, very complex chemical world. And we put those complex chemicals into the most complex machine that exists on the face of the Earth, which is the human body. It's a huge chemical container. I know that people think that chemicals are only to be found in test tubes or in Erlenmeyer flasks. But we are nothing more than a large bag of chemicals, hundreds of thousands of different compounds. And the fact is that chemicals are not to be feared or worshipped. They are to be understood. They are just things. They are inanimate. They don't make any decisions. We do. Let me give you an example. Ammonia, pretty simple molecule, but one of the most interesting molecules that exists. It has changed our history. Ammonia can be used as fertilizer, first developed by Fritz Haber, a German chemist. It gives amazing improvements in yields on agricultural fields. It allows us to feed millions of people. The world would not be the same without ammonia. But let me open up a can of worms here. Or in fact, let me defer to Jamie Oliver, who does that all by himself very well. Opens up numerous cans of worms. For those of you who are not familiar with JV, he's a celebrated British chef who has come over to America to change the habits, eating habits of North Americans. To tell you the truth, I like Jamie. He pushes fruits, he pushes vegetables. I like his theory. His approach is a little bit questionable. Not long ago, on a celebrated TV program, he introduced us to pink slime, which is neither pink nor slimy. What it is, is meat that is taken off the bone after everything else has been cut off through a mechanical process. In fact, it is mostly muscle meat, but then it is treated with ammonia gas to make sure that there are no bacteria cruising around. Well, he introduced this, this idea, and he wanted to demonstrate the nefarious nature of ammonia as it is being used in this process. So he opens up a cupboard in the back, and he takes out a bottle of ammonia, festooned with the skull and crossbones. Now, I spent my life in chemistry in many laboratories around the world. Never have I seen a bottle of ammonia that had the skull and crossbones on it. In fact, you can go looking in supermarkets and hardware stores or you can cruise the web. You will not find a bottle of ammonia that has the skull and crossbones. So that, of course, was made specifically for the show for the dramatic effect. And then Jamie goes and takes that bottle of ammonia and sloshes it all over the meat. This is not the way that it is done. Ammonia vapor is used in the process of producing that so-called pink slime. Well, first of all, there's nothing dangerous about ammonia vapor. Ammonia is used in our food supply. It's used to make cookies, causes them to rise. In fact, ammonia can even be used in cough problems. So it's not inherently dangerous. Of course, all chemicals can in some way be a problem, depends on how you use them, what the conditions are, and of course, how much of the chemical is used. But the way that Jamie portrayed this, it was certainly enough to frighten people, to have people demonstrate in the streets to stop pink slime. Now, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm a pusher of pink slime. I'm not. Uh, 
but it is not a toxic substance the way that it was portrayed. And in fact, it is probably leaner than the rest of the meat that is in the hamburger. It also allows the meat industry to use the cow more efficiently. Now you would think that cows would be happy at the prospect of having this pink slime be taken off the market as many fast food uh, producers have done in response to this. Well, no, that isn't exactly true. The cows are not all that happy about this because about one and a half million more cows are going to sacrifice their life annually to compensate for the meat that is not being taken off the bone. So you have to look at the whole situation. It is so easy to make people paranoid by nitpicking and by essentially uh, misleading them by taking segments of information which aren't the totality, which are not, not completely correct. Now, I'm not a pusher of pink slime and not even of meat. I think in North America we eat too much meat. I think we should cut down on the amount of meat we eat. We don't need the gigantic hamburgers. I've always pushed fruits and vegetables. Uh, we have plenty of epidemiological evidence that people who eat lots of fruits and vegetables are, are healthier. So that's not why I pick a bone with Jamie. Uh, it is because he misrepresents the science. There's nothing toxic about this business of, of pink slime. It is possible to portray almost anything as if it were dangerous, even our fruits and vegetables. Take an apple, for example, or better yet, take a bite out of that apple. You know what you're tasting? You're tasting over 300 different compounds. Those are not additives, they're not pesticide residues, those are the building blocks of that apple. That's what it's made up of. Some delightful things, acetone, well, the last time you encountered it was probably on the label of your nail polish remover right above where it says, do not drink. <laughs> There's also some formaldehyde in that apple. That's embalming fluid. That's the stuff that is used to preserve dead bodies. It's not people want in their live bodies. Well, here we have an apple. It has acetone. Acetone is highly toxic. In fact, you could put a cross and skull bones on, on it. Uh, so what happens if you're in an apple? Are you going to be poisoned by the acetone? Well, it's okay because there's also formaldehyde in there, so if you go, it's an economical way to go because you'll be pre-embalmed. <laughs> well, of course, it's absurd to suggest this, because as we understand, the amount of acetone and the amount of formaldehyde in the apple is trivial in comparison to valuable vitamins and, and polyphenols that we have in there. Numbers matter. There are no safe substances, only safe ways to use substances. 500 years ago, Paracelsus, the great alchemist, philosopher, physician, told us, sola dosis facit venenum. For those of you who've forgotten your Latin, let's translate. Only the dose makes the poison. Amounts matter. You know that aspirin makes a headache go away. How much? You take an aspirin tablet, you lick it, your headache will not go away. You take two tablets and you swallow them, your headache will go away. You take the whole bottle of tablets, swallow them, you will go away. <laughs> Only the dose makes the poison. However, it is also important to realize that sometimes that dose can be very small. We have to look at numbers. For example, the chemical that you have heard a great deal about called bisphenol A, it's been in the news extensively. This is the stuff that can leach out of canned foods from the epoxy resin that lines the food, protecting the can from interacting with the food and vice versa. Well, Bits of bisphenol A, very small doses, do leach out. And they do end up in, their, in our body. In fact, we can detect them in our urine. The problem is that this chemical, bisphenol A, is referred to as an endocrine disruptor. It can interfere with hormones. Anything that interferes with hormones should raise the flag of alarm. So this has been extensively investigated. We don't have a final answer. Science rarely gives us a final answer. 
It's a bizarre compound because it seems that the dose response curve is strange. Usually you expect toxicity to increase linearly with dose. It seems that in case of hormonal compounds, that's not what happens. So that even at very small concentrations, you can have significant effects. In fact, you can have a beneficial effect and you decrease the dose, you get a detrimental effect. I mean, this is the most unusual thing. So bisphenol A has to be further investigated because this concept, which we know as hormesis, is relatively new in science. Toxicology is a very complex business. But there are many, many other things in life to worry about than the trace amounts of bisphenol A that end up in our, our body. People drive without seat belts, they smoke, they lie out in the midday sun. Those are far, far more worrisome things than the trace amounts of bisphenol A. Life is full of risks. We can't get away from it. You can be out for a casual walk and horrific things can happen. Oh, don't worry, we're nice people, we faked it, they're fine. But they are, they're not the innocent little creatures that you think they are. So there is risk everywhere. We live with the presence of risk, especially with chemicals. But the presence of a chemical does not equal to the presence of risk. It depends on amounts. Today, with our modern analytical techniques, our gas chromatographs, our mass spectrometers, we can detect substances down to levels of parts per trillion. That's one second in 32,000 years. That's not finding a needle in a haystack. That's finding a needle in a world full of haystacks. And while you're rummaging around in that haystack, you might encounter some mold that will produce some really toxic substances, even though it's natural. Because natural does not equate to safe, and synthetic does not equal dangerous. That is one of the biggest myths out there. You cannot tell anything about the potential toxicity of a substance by its ancestry. The only way we know if something is dangerous or not is by studying it, by looking at its molecular structure, by analyzing it, by carrying out chemical reactions, by studying it in animals. But high-dose studies in animals do not necessarily reflect on humans. The human is not a giant rat, with some exceptions, obviously. <laughs> so one has to be very careful, because even in closely related species, there are tremendous differences. Dioxin, widely talked about as the most toxic substance known to mankind, which it may be. It's never produced on purpose. It's always a byproduct of some industrial process, but it is in our environment. It is indeed the most toxic substance if you're a guinea pig. But if you're a hamster, you can practically frolic in it. <laughs> so here we have two very closely rated species, and yet the toxicity profile is dramatically different. And then we come to people. We can't even really relate between animals in terms of toxicity. How can we use animals to predict what will happen in humans? We can't really, but it's the best guess because we can't do human studies. But where we really run into problems is predicting what will happen in children. Why? Because a child is not a small adult. Their body chemistry is very different. So we have to be especially careful when we expose children to chemicals like endocrine disruptors, because they may not be at all harmful in adults, but they may play a role in children. Unfortunately, we are surrounded by risk, as we said. You cannot get away from it. You may replace one with the other, but if you're not careful, the replacement may turn out to be more dangerous than what you're replacing. So when we think about replacing bisphenol A with some novel entity, we had better make sure that what we're introducing into the marketplace is better and safer than what we are replacing. Of course, there will be diverse opinions on all these things. That's the way science works. People read the literature, they do experiments, they come to various conclusions. Not always the same conclusion. No matter what you look at, there are always varied opinions. However, they rarely have equal weight. 
when you look at global warming, you look at endocrine disruptors, you will have the majority of the scientific community on one side with some outliers on the other side, but very often the outliers are far more vocal and make for a very seductive case. But in the scientific world, of course, we go by peer-reviewed literature, we go by experiments. We don't cherry-pick data. But unfortunately, pseudoscientists very often do. And these days, there's so much published that you can basically find some proof for any idea that you may have. However, when you practice scientific methodology, you don't cherry pick, you shake the whole cherry tree until all the cherries come down, and then you mix them together and mash them up, and then you taste the evidence. And hopefully then you don't get into a jam. <laughs> That's what the scientific method is all about weighing the risks versus the benefits. But in order to do that, we need some foundation. We need some basic understanding of science. So that's why I'm a big promoter of education early on. We need to improve scientific education in elementary schools. It is as important to be scientifically literate as to be literate in any other area. And we have to pursue this scientific literacy, no matter how hard that may be. We have to make sure that we eventually have an educated, scientifically literate public. Because all the technological decisions that we make are based upon some sound understanding of chemistry. It's not that we should be out there cheerleading for chemistry. That's not the idea at all. What we need to do is come to some rational evaluations. Make sure that people understand that chemicals are not substances that should be locked away, neither should they be glorified. They should be understood and put to good intelligent use. That's what we try to do today under the umbrella of green chemistry. We have a large pedestal of information today on which to build. We know toxicity profiles of chemicals. We know what we should choose as raw materials. We know how to make reactions more and more efficient. Chemistry is evolving all the time. We're getting better at predicting what is going to happen when we engage in this, what I think is a magical undertaking. Not everyone shares my view. There are those who think that chemists are different from any other species. But hopefully I've been able to demonstrate to you that that isn't the case, that we do have some humanity. Uh, we do look at the world in terms of molecules and what they can and cannot do. It doesn't mean that we can answer all questions. No, we can't. We have our limitations. The world is very complex. Those 60 million chemicals engage in all kinds of reactions. And it is quite possible that there are questions to which we will never have the answer. But we try. <laughs> we try to find the answers, and that is just what we do through our office at McGill, which is a rather unique enterprise. Uh, we are next week relaunching our website under a new URL. Uh, it is going to be better and more engaging than it uh, ever has been. And you can also follow us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And whenever you have any questions, feel free to address us. That's why we are there. We hope to try to demystify your life and show you that indeed there is a little magic in chemistry. Thank you. Thank you.